Welcome to the pilot episode of the Brees Creator Podcast. I'm Lee Brees. I am the guy behind the mic, the host, star, producer, director, whatever you want to call me. I am the guy that's probably going to be behind this mic for the entire life of this podcast. So anyway, make sure you tune in the entire time. We have some great stories. I'm going to spend the majority of this pilot episode talking about uh, the podcast itself, kind of some background information about it, some of the things that made me want to do it, some history about myself, just so you can get an idea of what we're going to have coming up as soon as we start uh, this podcast series. So without further ado, I'm just going to start off by saying a little bit about what I've done so far, either in the podcast world or in uh, the art realm. So I am, my personal background is in woodworking. So when I started doing woodworking, I was a very, very young. Um, my dad did it. My grandfather was a union carpenter. Um, so woodworking is something that's been in my background for a very long time. But I lost my dad when I was a sophomore in high school. That was actually only two years ago when I was 16. I'm 18 now. Um, but since he passed away, I really lost a resource and an inspiration for me to do woodworking. Um, and so I then turned to the internet. Being as young as I am, I decided to maximize my resources and look into some of the other opportunities out there and some of the resources I had online. And so I discovered some of the great online woodworkers, uh, Matthias Wendell, Bob Claggett, uh, some ones I've discovered recently, like uh, Jimmy DeResta, Ch- Chop with Chris, some of those great great online woodworkers that do uh, they do woodworking but a lot of what they do is also kind of theatrics too and they also uh, started some podcasts um, I love listening to those I didn't start listening to those so about three or four months ago but I really do enjoy listening to all of those podcasts um, they really provide inspiration I love hearing stories about other woodworkers and their backgrounds um, definitely some great stories there and I love because I mean me in my youth I have no experience doing any of this well I say that but I kind of do Uh, But I love listening to some of the great stories about things I've never heard before. Always inspiring. So anyway, I started this Instagram page for Brees Woodworking about, uh, I don't know, about, I think it was the week after Thanksgiving of 2016. Um, And I started it because, uh, you know, one of the things that frustrated me when I lost my dad is that there's a lot of things around the house that he made. And I just don't have any idea what there's a story behind them or what year they were made or why he made them or where the materials came from or things like that. So I decided to start um, uh, kind of like a, I don't know, a mental blog. I hate to say I'm selfish, but the Instagram page was kind of just for me uh, to kind of commemorate every project, every significant event uh, that I do that's woodworking related. Uh, so I started it and I posted some pictures that I had uh, for the longest time that I'd just taken. Um, I could have done a blog, um, and that's something I still want to do. As I, In fact, on my website, I have a link for a project history blog. That's reesewoodworking.wixsite.com. Um, but I haven't posted anything yet, and I don't see that happening anytime soon just because... Um, I really want to make that more about some of the projects that I find that are my dad's as I learn more about some of the projects around my house, or maybe there's a project that's more meaningful to me. Um, I love to write up something about it and share it with everyone. But going back to the Instagram page, so now I post anytime I'm out in the shop, anything like that. I try to post kind of like a recap of what I did, what I was working on, how things worked, what went bad, if I broke anything. Uh, Just so, you know, years down the road, I can just mentally try to replay some of the things in my head uh, that I did did when I was younger, especially in my young woodworking career. Um, so now I, I, I still use it. I have about, I don't know, about 40 posts or so. Um, but the Instagram page is just the beginning. I hope to take the Brees woodworking uh, concept into a new light. Um, but I say that I do woodworking and I do that's definitely my passion but one of the things I love about some of these new channels that do woodworking they do not just woodworking but they're kind of evolving into make channels I the two that come to mind are I like to make stuff by Bob Claggett and Jimmy Derisa's page I mean they started out in woodworking but they kind of understand what the future is and that's kind of what I want to allude to in this podcast is that the future itself 
I mean, they put so much emphasis in schools on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And there's a lot of great things there. But if you ever watch any futuristic movie, like I was just watching the Lost in Space movie just a couple nights ago. And there's some other great movies you can think of that are 100 years down the line, 200 years, 1,000 years, 100,000 years, whatever. But if you notice that if you if you watch some of the youth or even some of the adults in that movie, not only are they more intelligent, but they're more handy with their hands and they have a better knowledge of their own machines they can build they can fix they can do whatever i mean in the lost in space movie i mean will robinson at 10 years old uh is remaking his robot um so that's something that i think the future definitely needs to capitalize on that's the way the future is going to be and we always emphasize kids sitting in a classroom at a desk taking notes taking tests uh learning I mean, learning math equations, learning how to solve math equations, that's really not going to prepare anybody for the future. Um, I, what I like about some of these make channels is that they're, they're not focusing on one specific area, whether it's art or woodworking or metalworking or whatever. They're, they're trying to combine multiple aspects, making machines, uh, screen printing, uh, something that's definitely important to a lot of um, different aspects of life and I'm glad they're starting to do that because that's what I envision the future and I, I personally uh, want to be able to build a coffee table build a robot program a light program a computer build my own computer that's something I hope to do in the future um, simply because I don't really want to buy a computer off the shelf that's going to be mediocre um, but that's definitely something that's got me started my woodworking career was being able to solve problems uh, for me without having to spend any money or should I say very little money um, but that's what I want to do in the future, and I want to inspire others to do that, and that's kind of what the mission is of this podcast. And I say it's a, a creator podcast, and I start off by saying that it was a woodworking podcast, but I want to be dead honest that this podcast is probably going to be more tuned to woodworking just because that's what I do. That's what inspires me. Um, that's what I have. I have a woodworking shop, so a lot of the things I do are going to be woodworking related, but a lot of the places I don't want to, t- I want to take this podcast is um, involving making, is involving creating, is involving inventing and innovating and all the things that I feel that like society is going to kind of take aim at. You know, we talk about pushing to the future. Um, I had this discussion with my mom the other day about uh, c- cutting our cord for cable. Um, and I said, um, this is kind of how I think when I think about doing something like that, is that, you know, I said to my mother, which is being more innovative? Which do you see being more prevalent in the future? Um, we thought about it. Um, and c- cables kind of reached its, its max. Um, and so sh- she said, um. Uh, okay, and then I and then I went back and quickly replied. I said, "Cable is at its max. TV is at its max. There's nothing more you can do to innovate cable and TV." Of course, I say that hoping to inspire someone to make some massive invention uh, to cable or TV. Um, but I but this whole idea of cutting the cord and all these other resources of watching things online and whatnot is really starting to explode. And that's what I encouraged her to think about it in that way, and I encourage you to think about it in that way as well. Um, and so in terms of people handing us things, we buying things, going to Ikea and buying a shelf, uh, going to Walmart and buying a pan, uh, things like that. That is, it's kind of at its max. And I think we've kind of had a shift in culture definitely from the late 20th century from where you used to buy a machine and you got the schematic. And if you wanted to fix it, you could take it apart and put it back together and get all the parts for it. Whereas we kind of had the shift towards the late 20th century to a world where companies chose to maximize profit via uh, not making those resources available so that way if something broke you had to buy a completely new machine uh, whether it be a refrigerator a table saw circular saw whatever that was kind of their mode of thought Um, so i think now we're going to go a shift again as because the internet's more available and companies can't really monopolize uh, that kind of resource that we're going to go to a world where everything is going to be fixable everything will be repairable and you'll be able to probably make anything i think one of the biggest inspirations i've uh, had in the last two years since i lost my dad was that um watching matthias wandel build all of these machines 
Um, he, if you don't, if you're not familiar with his page, he's a Canadian woodworker, German born. He was an engineer. Um, now he does woodworking for a living uh, on his YouTube channel and his website. And he's designed and made all of these really cool, really well made machines in his workshop. So I mean, his biggest thing is his bandsaw, but I mean, he's made everything: table saw, uh, disc sander. Uh, a lot of different woodworking machinery that I think. Uh, I, I mean, I'm going to make more. I made the I made his bandsaw. I hopefully uh, I can buy and make some of his other plans. I'm actually waiting for him right now to come out with uh, his sawmill plans for his 20 inch uh, bandsaw. Uh, I've really wanted to make his bandsaw, uh, so I've made that. But I bought the 16 inch to have in my shop, and I want to make the 14. I want, wanted to make the 14 inch uh, one for a sawmill. But I, I he, when he came out with his 20 inch one, I was like, um, yeah, I'm going to wait till he makes a sawmill plan for that because he said he was going to eventually. But back to the point. So he tells a story about why he first made a bandsaw out of wood. It's 100 percent out of wood. Um, but there's I mean, obviously, there's some hardware here and there and the, the motor's not wood. Uh, but the, the, the whole concept, the design, the frame, uh, the blade guys, I mean, the majority of the machine is wood. And he says in one of his videos about uh, when he was reviewing his bandsaws is that he went to a garage sale one day uh, in the morning and he saw a cheap little bandsaw and he paid him for it. He paid the guy for it and he said, I'm going to come back later because he didn't have his car. And so he came back later to pick up the bandsaw with his car and the guy had already sold it again. So he had, someone had paid him, he effectively had collected money twice for it and that just... Um, really upset Matthias Wendell. And so what he did is he got his money back, praise the Lord, lucky him. Uh, he went back and he said, screw it, I'm just going to make one. And so he actually made an 18-inch bandsaw out of wood. He just messed around with the design for a long time, got something that worked, uh, saw what was wrong with it, and then he made another one. He made a 16-inch, and then he refined it some more, made a 14-inch, and then this that was about five or six years ago. And now he has... Uh, his 20 inch design which is in my opinion his best one yet they just keep getting better but even since then he's designed a lot of other machines in his shop and the the other thing that's really cool is that he's kind of gone away from having just one big dust collector and he's made all these little itty bitty dust collectors for each individual machine and that might seem tedious or annoying or unnecessary or bulky um, but if you have any experience in woodworking and using a long hose or trying to use a dust collector system a, the bags fill up incredibly quick. B, the suction is terrible. I mean, the longer the suction is, you know, over the course of a longer uh, length. Um, and so this whole idea of creating multiple little dust collector systems is absolutely great. I mean, the other thing, too, is that you can never perfect your dust collecting technique. Um, but I don't, that's that kind of thing that I really don't want to delve in too much in this podcast just because. I don't want to make this a woodworking only podcast. If you listen to some of the great podcasts out there, I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to uh, what will hopefully will be a big rival uh, at some point, uh, the Making It podcast. I mean, Jimmy DeRista, David Picciuto, and Bob Claggett, they don't talk about you know how to cut a dovetail joint. They don't talk about how they made a table. Uh, what they do is they talk about their experiences in the shop. Um, kind of what goes through their head, some of their experience that they have. I love listening to Jimmy. I always love when Jimmy Darista chimes in because he always adds something to the conversation that he, that the other two can't because he's done, he's made things his entire life. Um, I def desperately encourage you to check out his channel and the podcast because, I mean, he has the whole whole background and just making things for a living and what's that what's that like? I mean, he literally you know, gets clients and makes things for people. He does branding. Uh, in terms of product placement and whatnot, makes stands and decorations for you know branding products, and then he also he also teaches a class, and in that class he teaches things like molding, screen printing, how to make simple things. Uh, very cool, but definitely a class. If I was in New York City, I would take, which I'll go ahead and talk about now. So I am actually based in Brownsburg, Indiana, which is about 20 minutes northwest of Indianapolis. So if you're looking on the map, it's going to look like I'm in Indianapolis, even though I'm just outside of it. Indianapolis takes up all of Marion County, which is pretty much the most center county in Indiana. And then Hendricks County is uh, just to the left of it, and I'm on the north side uh, of Indianapolis there. So um, in terms of being connected to all of the woodworkers in the woodworking community, we're kind of all scattered across the U.S. 
um, which is really cool because it really presents an opportunity for us to encounter different people, uh, learn about different uh, kind of woodworking cultures and how they formed across the country. The other thing that's cool about it too is that you know being w- in woodworking, um, there's you know it's how people get the resources. So if if some some guy in Georgia uh, may have a different wood supply than someone uh, in Minnesota or someone in New York City. Um, I know me personally, I get all of my wood from the trash. I'm not, I'm not skilled enough, nor do I have the experience or the money, to be honest. Probably actually take that even back a step. We'll scratch out all I just said and say time. I don't have the time to do any of the, of the resawing or the, the lumber harboring or the drying. I don't need space to do the drying either. What I, I just purely get wood out of the trash. I go pallet hunting and that, and I'm fortunate enough to live out in the suburbs um, not even the suburbs. Brownsburg itself is a suburb. I live outside of Brownsburg. I, don't, I technically live in just the county. I don't live in Brownsburg, but I'm about 15, 20 minutes from uh, the middle of Brownsburg itself. It's not too far away. Maybe even less than that. Probably about 10 minutes. It takes about 20 minutes to get to school. 20 mi- the school itself is on the south side of Brownsburg. But the, the thing about the suburbs in the last 10, 15 years is that they just keep growing and expanding uh, just so they can they build more houses outside the city. And now that the... In, you know, interior part of the suburbs have really been built up. They keep expanding out and out and out and out and out, building more and more uh, houses and neighborhoods. Uh, here in the suburbs, we have all kinds of names. We call them I mean, house farms, converted cornfields, cookie cutter houses. Uh, because the thing is that, you know, not only are these houses being built farther in the middle of nowhere, farther and farther outside the city, um, they all look the same. They're all painted the same color. It's like if you ever look at one of those maps from the 1950s, um, when they're selling those new houses um, and the new developments, like one of those old, old posters, that's literally what it looks like out here. Um, but what's really great about that is that you can get pretty consistent wood scraps in the trash. Um, and that's what I started out doing. I actually started out pallet hunting, uh, going around to various places looking for pallets to collect wood, uh, industrial pallets even, uh, really, because, I mean, really some of the smaller pallets, the shipping pallets are really just not that great quality. But the shipping pallets, the industrial pallets, are huge. They're made to ship extremely heavy things. They're made out of two by fours. They're absolutely great quality. They usually ship something once and just throw it away, whereas pallets are used multiple times. Um, but beyond that, um, I, there's this one place I was going to, and they uh, eventually started throwing things out. I'm not sure what their story is. They had a huge pile, and they cleaned everything up. But well, I bring up the houses because that's really where my primary resource is. You know, it's amazing uh, when you're trying to keep on schedule and keep on a budget how much waste you produce just because you're not trying to utilize all of the resources you have. So, I mean, there's a lot of two-by-fours, whole two-by-fours that are out there. Um, and what's amazing is that if you go through a dumpster, a lot of times they just have a pile on the, on, in the front yard. Uh, you can just drive by and look through their pile. What's amazing, what great selection you have uh, just because, I mean, you know, I'm kind of to the point where I'm skilled enough to know what kind of wood I'm looking for and kind of throw everything, out, throw everything else off to the side. You know, I can surf through a, a dumpster pile for an hour and just find everything that's straight. I mean, I can find whole eight foot two by fours that are completely straight, probably find 10 or 20 of them just in one dumpster just by looking hard enough that also are fairly clean. That's kind of the other big thing about using old wood and machinery um, is that when you get something out of, a, especially off a construction site or you get a pallet, it's very dirty. There's little pebbles in it everywhere. It destroys your machinery. And that's kind of one of the things that I first after my dad dies, I just got all this wood, immediately ran it right through the joiner and through the planer and it just it destroyed my joiner the the knives are just beyond repair um, if i ever use the joiner again i'm just got to buy <laughs> new knives um the planer eh, kind of the same story but it's it still works and i so any of the uh any of the indentations i can i just plan off with a hand plane or sand them off that's kind of the way that being creative is kind of evolving that's kind of why i bring all that up uh, people aren't going out and buying materials. They're kind of utilizing what they have on hand, finding things in the trash. Um, everyone has their great story of that one day they were out driving and they saw this great thing out in the trash. I am told that every person online who does woodworking or machinery or whatever, anytime they see a motor out in the trash, they grab it. And they talk like they see motors all the time. Oh, every week I see two or three. I just grab them all. I've had that perspective for about three years now, and I have yet to find something with an electric motor in the trash. Now, I don't actually, I don't actively pursue 
looking into the trash. I've not come across one yet. So maybe that's just where I live. Now, I myself do not live in a cookie cutter house farm converted cornfield neighborhood. I personally live uh, in a developed area that's it's kind of like an it's it's kind of like a neighborhood but it's kind of not it's kind of like a road that's kind of like it connects it connects the corner so you have the corner of two intersections of road and then you have uh, another road and a curve that's kind of like my neighborhood it kind of makes uh, the roads kind of form a square um, so it's kind of a neighborhood kind of not I really like it just because there's no homeowners association uh, and so I kind of can do whatever I want on my property. Um, but the, that's been a kind of a positive and a negative. Um, the positive is um, is that I can open burn on my property. Uh, I, I can have a mini barn. I can have a shop. I can do whatever I want um, in terms of you know adding on to my property without having anything connected to my house. Um, some of the negatives is that people think or kind of take that I can do whatever I want to the extreme. That and being able to do whatever you want is kind of positive and negative. I like the fact because none of the houses look the same. That's except for the house directly across from me. For some reason, all the all the houses in the, my entire neighborhood look different except for mine and the one across from me are exactly the same. So that's kind of interesting how that worked out. Um, but some of the things look tacky. Like some people have a fence around the entire property. Some don't. Um, what, what I really don't like is the people who try to accommodate a business or something and they put in a second driveway out to their backyard. And so imagine a typical neighborhood with that kind of setup. It looks kind of wonky, um, but at the same time, I appreciate having the freedom and no control of a homeowners association, let alone trying to pay the bills to be in a homeowners association. So I've kind of given you some feedback on kind of some things that I want to touch up on. I'm going to talk about now a little bit more about uh, the podcast itself. So in the future, hopefully once we get to our first episode, second episode, there's going to be kind of be a theme. Um, hopefully that can keep me more on track instead of just kind of shooting aimlessly into the dark um, about topics um, ranging from the the cliche ones, like where does creativity come from, how do you get motivation, finding time, things like that. Um, but I, I hope to eventually expand the podcast to where I'm interviewing people um, who are great creators, who are great makers, people who have a great story to tell but don't have the opportunity uh, to share it. So one of the great things I've discovered recently is that, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, all of the great woodworkers uh, don't live near here. I'm thinking that, you know, they, you know, Bob Cladgett's in Georgia, Matthias Wandel's in Canada, Matt Cremona is in Minnesota, Jimmy Duress is in New York. Um, but what I've discovered is actually that there's quite a few woodworkers in my area. There's um, there's a couple I can think of that are on the east side. Um, a lot of them just scattered throughout the state. This this is just I've all found through my Instagram page, which has been probably the greatest resource thus, thus far. Because um, when my dad died, he had this great tool collection. I still have most of it. He had a lot of antique tools just for financing reasons. I had to sell all of those, which is kind of disappointing. Um, but at the same time, being a young person, having a collection like that is would, is very limiting um, just because I can't you know get up and move around or go to college or whatnot, having those kind of things around. But he still has all of these tools that he used to do other things, and I didn't know what half of them were. And so I kind of started this little Instagram series of what is it, not to be cliche, uh, but a what is it. Uh, kind of catalog of posting these things. I don't know what they are. And within, I mean, I think the longest time it's taken someone on my Instagram page to identify any of the tools was probably, I think, five minutes. The nine or 10 posts that I've done like that have really come back in 10 seconds or less. And the thing is that a lot of these tools I've literally just looked at for years and walked by every day and had no idea what they were and thought, I'm never going to know what this thing is. And yet, when you utilize the community around you, um, it's amazing uh, what can happen. So, uh, talking about the woodworking community itself, that's kind of been one of the things that's really been a virtue to me. And I feel like that's something that's going to be really great in the future. And that's kind of like the, the future of everything is um, we're just so interconnected now with social media and the internet. Uh, it's unlike anything ever before. And what's crazy about usually being a maker or a woodworker or a metalworker or an artist is that it's a very isolated activity. 
And so now um, we're seeing people who usually spend hours or days in the shop by themselves starting to get involved and sharing and communicating and inviting people over for shop visits and shop tours um, and just to kind of see what people make and whatnot. And people's homes are becoming galleries of, of to show off their work to other people and people are becoming more connected. And it's just such, it's such a great thing. Um, and what's great is that, you know, me, I'm, me being very young, again, I'm an 18 year old senior in high school currently. I don't really share this interest with anyone. I have not met anyone my age who has the same interest or passion uh, that I do, but that's kind of, I think, more because of a lack of opportunity. Um, I always look back to the early, you know, probably before the 80s when they had shop class um, as a regular required class, and now they don't, and they've kind of, you know, my school is about to demolish what's left of their shop class hallway. Um, but I think I don't think students my age have the opportunity uh, to kind of learn about that because every kid I've invited over to come help me in the shop for a day has had a feisty passion, and they always want to come back. In fact, um, I invited a kid over one time to come work with me on my bandsaw when I was making it, and he came over at 2 o'clock in the afternoon after he had sat on the couch all morning, and I just begged him to come over, and as soon as he got in, he was like, why did I wait so long? He was there probably till about 4 in the morning, uh, then he went home, slept for about 6 hours, then came back, and we worked on the bandsaw some more. Um, so it's really, it's really cool just because I've experienced woodworking my entire life, been doing it since I was born. Uh, it's really cool to see how other people get excited about woodworking uh, and how they really get into it. And I think just making in general gets a lot of people excited. I see that especially when we're given a project or something in class. Um, that's really something that really gets kids excited to work with their hands. And so I think it's really disappointing that kids don't have more opportunities like that. I was very fortunately blessed to inherit a complete shop. Well, I don't want to say complete shop, a very good start shop. A lot of great tools out there. I, I can't, I can't, I mean, it's hard to fathom not having that out there, especially trying to be a woodworker and starting from scratch. Um, hopefully I'll open a metal shop and I'll experience what starting from scratch is like. Uh, but for the time being, I'm just going to stick with uh, my setup for now, just doing woodworking and whatnot. Hopefully I'll expand a little more, but obviously that's down the road. But I really like providing this opportunity for other people to experience what making, creating, and designing and all the things like that are like just because so many people don't have that opportunity. So through this podcast, I hope to expand. I hope to advertise. I hope to get people interested. And really this this podcast is going to be targeted for experienced people. Who have who've done woodworking, who've done making, who've done creating, who are really, really passionate about it. But I am going to try and reach a broader audience in the sense that I want to bring people in. So I'm going to make a lot of appeals to people who have never made anything before, who have never touched a piece of wood or a saw, or have never turned on a table saw, have no idea what that sounds like, have never touched a drill press, have never held a drill. You know, it's kind of funny when you hand someone a drill for the first time and ask them to change a bit and they're just kind of like, uh, what? Or if you see them try to start a screw or something for the first time, that's pretty funny too. <laughs> but like I said, I want to reach a broader audience and try to get in as many people as possible. So if you feel alienated just because you're an experienced person, please hang in there. In every episode, I'm going to try to make an appeal to both, try to have something in there for both because one of the great things about this activity is is that you only get better by surrounding yourself with people who are better than you. And that's true in every aspect of life. Um, and so if I get somebody interested um, in, in this activity and I, I bring them in and they're listening and they connect with things and then further down the episode they hear something that they don't understand or they don't know how to do and all of a sudden they're completely fascinated with trying to figure out or discover what that thing is uh, and how to do it. So hopefully that I can accomplish that. That's kind of the goal of this podcast. Um, but I think this is going to be the end of the first episode. So I'm glad you listened. And this, this is our pilot episode. Hopefully you're going to have a series upcoming, like again, with more specific topics. You can find all of the episodes on SoundCloud and on YouTube on the Brees Woodworking YouTube page. And you can go to our website at breesewoodworking.wixsite.com for all all of the updates um, and all the episodes um, if you go to the P creator podcast tab on our website it's very obvious um, if you have any comments or questions you can either leave a comment on our website on this episode itself or you can uh, email me at breeswoodworking.com again my name is lee Brees. i appreciate you listening to this um, I, I appreciate feedback or any ideas you have for topics for the podcast anything you want me to talk about touch up on i greatly appreciate it 
So that's going to do it. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you keep listening or keep paying attention. You can follow our Brees Creator Podcast Twitter page uh, for all the updates and episodes upcoming. So for the outro for this podcast, I want to give a shout out to an artist online who has produced music and released it into the public domain. Artists who produce music and release it into the public domain, I feel like really understand what art is, what its purpose is, and how it contributes to the society around it. Uh, So I want to give a a big thanks to the people who do that online by putting them actually and featuring them in the podcast. Uh, So I'm going to close this episode with the Silent Partners, Ether. Um, Ether. I don't know how to say it, but you can check them out on YouTube. I'm sure they're on SoundCloud as well. Just Google, just Google that. You'll find it. You can listen to it, and that's. Um, I'll hopefully put a link to it in the show notes that I'll have eventually on our website. So thanks again. Have a great, great time. I'll see you next time on the Breeze Creator Podcast. Mm-hmm.